Well, we're on day 21 of our uh, 21 days of prayer and fasting. So we finished. Way to go. Whether you were fasting from social media or television or some type of food fast or whatnot, you did it. You made it. And whether you're breaking your fast today or tomorrow morning, however you structured it, I'm proud of you. Good job. And we're beginning a a two-part series this week and next week uh, today on stewardship. And today we're going to be talking specifically on stewarding our finances. Now, I love what Wayne Cordero says about uh, this whole topic of stewardship and finances, where he says that methods are many, principles are few, methods always change, but God's principles never do. And I love that because when we talk about finances, there's many methods to manage finances, to steward finances, to manage your life or different things like that. The methods are many out there. And, you know, there, there are some that, are, that do good over here, some that do good over there. But anyways, principles never change. And so God's principles, what we see in the Bible when it comes to stewarding, stewarding our lives, our money, um, our time, all that stuff, that the methods of how we do that, they might change and have changed over the course of history on what life looks like and whether, uh, you know, you have job change or you have financial changes or you might have circumstances that change and the methods on how you deal with those might change, but God's principles never change. God's principles never change, that it says that the word of the Lord endures forever. And so we want to look at, well, what are these, when we think of stewardship and financially, what are the principles in God's word that never change? They're going to outlast the test of time. And they've been true since the beginning of the creation of the of earth. And they will, and they're still true today. And they'll continue to be true all the way until Jesus returns. So what are those principles that are few that never change? And we're going to look at maybe just a a few of those this morning. But, you know, the Bible speaks much about how we think, uh, speak, and deal with finances. That um, the Bible, there's about 2,300 scriptures that deal with this. Now, that's more scriptures than the Bible when it talks on uh, things like prayer or faith or heaven and hell, that there is many instances all throughout the Bible that just have something to do with how we think, talk, deal with um, our money. And that there's this fundamental connection in the scriptures between our spiritual lives and, again, how we think act, and deal with our money. Here's what uh, uh, Luke writes in uh, chapter 16. He says, whoever can be trusted with very little can also be trusted, uh, or who can be trusted with very little can also be trusted with much. And whoever is dishonest with very little will also be dishonest with much. So if you have not been trustworthy in handling worldly wealth, who will trust you with true riches? We see that there's this spiritual connection between how we handle our actual money and this uh, spirituality of true riches, what God might want to do here on earth or later in eternity, but these, the true riches that God wants to give our life and to you, to myself, that there's this spiritual connection on how we handle and deal with how we might think speak or act on uh, money or finances. And in here, we, we also see that God, in some sort of way, doesn't say exactly how, but in some sort of way, God's going to rate how ready we are for true riches. And we see that how he's going to rate us in some sort of way, if we're ready for these true riches, is the way that we think, act, or deal with money, the things that we're given And the way that we handle money is sort of like this boot camp for the true riches that God talks about. And so I just want to say, you know, maybe you don't know exactly how to handle money. And in this sermon, we're not going to get into all of that. But we don't want to just preach a sermon and then hope you figure it out. We want to provide you real resources that maybe you're new to handling money. 
Maybe you're a high school student. Maybe you're a university student. Maybe you've just graduated, you know, recently in the last couple years from college or high school and you're out in the marketplace and like you've never really ha- had to figure out how to, how to handle money and now you do. Or maybe you've gone a long period in your life and you look back and you say, I've never known how to handle money. Whatever it may be, we want to resource you as a church and not just preach a sermon on something. And so this is why we offer uh, a course called Financial Peace University. And in here, this will give you the real practical how to handle your money. So if you're new to handling money, this is for you. This will tell you exactly how and show you the real practical principles of how to handle money, create a budget, get out of debt, all of those things. Or if you find yourself later in, in life and you look back and go like, wow, I need help. This is for you as well. And so if, if you want to know how God says how we should handle our money, uh, Financial Peace University is for you. So that's coming up at the end of February. I want to encourage you to sign up for that. If you find yourself on any level in that, young, old, or in between, uh, someone can help you sign up uh, out in the lobby after the service. So anyways, God's going to somehow, you know, rate, and we, how we handle our money is going to be this like boot camp for true riches. And so, you know, does God want us rich in life? I believe yes, absolutely he does. But not just in money. I I believe God wants everyone to have provision, but not just in money. I I think yes, money is a part of that for sure. It'll help you be more comfortable. It'll help you be more generous. If you have the right heart that you can, you can do lots of things in your family, your community, your church, and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, money, but God doesn't want it just to be about financial gain, that God wants you to be rich because your life is far too precious just to be rich in money, that God cares about your emotional life, your relationships, your family, that he wants you to be rich in an abundance of stuff that goes far beyond just your financial wealth that you have. And your life is just too precious just to invest it unjustly in the accumulation of more and more and more money. But that being said, so what does God talk about? When we look at these, like, what are the, pr- the precious principles that don't change? And and I'll get into some of those here in just a second. But I will say that in order to accurately measure someone's spiritual maturity, maturity, it is said that you can look at three things to find an accurate uh, depiction of someone's spiritual maturity when it comes to finances. One, you can look at someone's bank account, their daily planner, and the interior of their car. (laughs) Now, that means, you know, with that, that means like when you look at your bank account, it's how you spend your money, your planner, how you spend your time, the interior of your car. Honestly, that one was just for me because I, I don't keep my car that clean. So that one was mine, not, not yours. But really when it comes to all of this, you know, it's about the financial heart of God's people. When we look at how we think, act, speak about finances, the Bible talks uh, in, Uh, extensively on it, and what it really boils down to is what is the financial heart of God's people? Where is is that? And that's some of the stuff we're going to look at. And to kind of break it down in a way that, you know, might help us all make sense of this, is I want to use this example that Pastor Wayne Cordero does. And I I love this example, just how we think through this in a lens that he he talks about uh, race cars, and that early on when race cars were in development and racing around, you know, what they found out is that as race cars developed, they would go at higher speeds and the engines would have higher, you know, capacity and these race cars, they'd get to a speed where the engine would get so hot that the oil would actually break down. And then when the oil breaks down, if you know anything about engines, when the oil breaks down because of the heat in an engine, bad things happen. And so what they figured out is that if you had this fuel or oil additive, that if you added it in, it could withstand higher heats. And this is where STP came from. Anyone use S, the, any of the STP products in like small engines or cars or boats or anything like that? Anyone use that or know what STP is? It's like a fuel additive, kind of like seafoam or some of those other ones out there, right? 
But um, what STP stands for is scientifically treated petroleum. That's what it is. And they figured out if you, they made this fuel additive in race cars, and if you added it in, now all of a sudden the oil wouldn't break down at certain high uh, heat. Uh, and so they could go faster, go longer distances, all those things. So when the, ra uh, the race got really hot, the car would be just fine. And so anyways, Wayne Cordero, he compares this to our spiritual life. And he says, Christians, we need an STP in our life as well. That when life gets really hot, when the pressure is on, life feels like it might be starting to break down around you. Maybe there's you know, some type of financial setback, a loss of a job, the market takes a downturn. Uh, you, you know, maybe there's some type of uh, diagnosis that you experience or just whatever it may be, a loss of a relationship, whatever might happen in life where life heats up real quick. And when life heats up and the pressure sinks in, what happens internally do we begin to break down? And we don't want to break down as Christians. And so what's that STP, that, that like additive to the spiritual life of a Christian? And here's what Wayne Cordero says. He says that STP is stewardship, tithing, and planning, STP. Stewardship, tithing, and planning. Now, this morning and next week, we're going to touch on stewardship, since we're in a stewardship series. Next week, we're going to touch a little bit more on planning, goal setting, financial planning. And today, we're going to touch a little bit more on tithing. So the S and the T will leave the P for next week. Sound good? So um, the, these principles, let's start with stewardship. You know, this is the first thing in that STP, the additive that we need in our own life. So when it gets hot, we don't break down is stewardship. And here's the thing is finances and this whole topic around the financial heart of God's people actually doesn't begin with money specifically. It begins with stewarding whatever you already have. Stewarding whatever you already have. How are you dealing faithfully with those small amounts, those few things? Because remember, God it kind of rates us in some way that if we're faithful with the small amounts, he will expand that and give you even more to be faithful with. And so, and from the beginning, we see this concept of stewardship all the way back to when God created the earth and he put man inside. We see this um, in Genesis chapter two, right at the beginning of the Bible, where it says the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden. And he had him work it and care for it, steward it. You were to work the land, you were to care the land. Other uh, translations of the Bible say that we, you are to tend it, that you're tending it, you're caring it, you're working it, you're, you're stewarding what God has given you. And all the way from the beginning, this principle of stewardship has not changed and will not change. That we are to steward what we already have, what God has already given you. So that means that we keep things clean, like the interior of our car. Lord, that one's mine, right? You keep things clean. You steward what you have, right? Um, you care for it. So how are you stewarding what you already have? That means your house, your apartment, your bedroom, your dorm. How are you stewarding that? How are you stewarding your car, your bank account, your relationships? How are you stewarding the gifts that God has given you, the talents he's given you, the abilities he's given you? How are you stewarding even your own body, that we are the temple of the living God, that he lives inside of us? That all of these things, we are to steward what we already have. It's a mindset, it's a perspective of God has placed me here to steward what he entrusts to me. And that if I take the stewardship mentality, my perspective changes and says, I'm here to care, tend, work, and honor what God has given me. Now I get like when we were to talk, if we were to talk about, you know, we were to steward our, our body or anything like that, I understand that there's also this aspect that, you know, says like, well, God loves me just as I am. And that's very true. You can come to God exactly as you are, just as I am. But also, God loves you too much just to leave you exactly how you are. Whether, you know, however that is, that God loves you and he wants you to steward things carefully so that the intention behind that is that we represent the Lord. 
in, in all aspects of our life. And whether it be inside your home, outside your home, in your workplace, whatever it may be that we are the representation of Christ, that when people look at you, they evaluate your life, they walk by their pastor's car and look inside of it. What do they see, right? They, what we want people to see when they look at you and they examine you and they examine your life is that they see not me, not you, they see Christ that we are to represent Jesus. So that means that I gotta get out of the way and I have to allow the Lord to work in my life, to be changing me, molding me. I have to honor what I have and honor what God has asked me so that not that people would see a better me, but they would see Jesus and they would see Christ. And that God has asked us to steward everything, not just some things, everything because it's all his you were bought at a price you were you were paid for you were his your wife is his your kids are his your bank account is his your car your house it's all his and he asked you to steward that carefully and so that we might represent him well so how are you stewarding what god has given you big or small whether you have very little or very much How are you stewarding that? Maybe you don't have anything to your name and all you have is yourself. That's great. That's a great starting place. How are you stewarding yourself? Who you are, your spirituality, your your emotional health, mental health, physical health, all of it. How are you stewarding that? Because the stewardship, that principle of tending and caring for what God has entrusted to you will never change. All right. That's the S. The T is tithe, the tithing. So here's what tithing means. Tithing, it means a tenth, but it's not just any tenth. It is the first tenth. It's the first tenth. So when we look at the word tithing in its original language, it means tenth, but it's the first tenth, not the second, not the third or the fourth, where it's at the very end, it's the first tenth tenth that you have. Or in other places in the Bible, we see that it's not the second fruits or the third fruits or the fourth fruits. It's the first fruits. Exactly. It's the first fruits of what you've been given. Or it's the first tenth. That you don't take the first tenth, second, and third for yourself. And then you have this final tenth and you're just like, oh, things are tight now. Do I give it or not? Or what what does the Lord want from me? It's the first fruits. That's what the tithe means. And what the tithe was, going all the way back to the Old Testament, is that it was to be used for the poor, caring for the poor, caring for the Lord's house, and the spreading of his message. That is what the tithe was used for. And in an agricultural world back then, what happened was farmers would till their soil, have crop, and when they came through to get their crop, they would leave a couple bushels of whatever their crop was behind so that the poor then could come through the fields and take from that. That was one of the first uh, places you see this giving back or giving up a tenth of what you had. And it, you know, we see other instances where uh, uh, the farmers would leave the corners of their plots. They weren't allowed to take the corners for themselves of their plots, and they had to leave those untouched for the poor. And then you see even other instances where, like, if you had a couple bush- bushels of whatever on your cart, and that even fell off the cart, you weren't allowed to pick it back up. You had to leave it there for the poor to come through. And then you, we see these other instances in which there might be a 10-acre plot of land that a farmer would have, and he would, you know, plant all, the, all of it, but he would sequester off one acre of the 10 acres, and that was called the Lord's Acre. And the Lord's Acre went directly to God. So whatever was uh, uh, grown on that one acre out of the 10 directly went to the Lord. So it was almost treated as a second business in a way in which we want to tend that acre well because whatever comes out of it is going to go to the Lord and the other nine acres go, you know, to uh, your own taking. And so as the world went from an agrarian society to an industrialized society, we don't bring bushels of wheat into the church anymore. 
I'm not saying we wouldn't accept it if that's your means, but I'm saying no one's doing that anymore. And so we now are compensated monetarily for what we do in life. And so as we've moved from agrarian to an industrialized society, the way that we tithe or give back to God is monetarily, and we see instances of that as well uh, in the Bible. And so anyways, this concept of giving a tenth or a tithe is spoken um, in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And it's something from generation to generation has been passed down and passed down all throughout history. And it's spoken of, and it's something God has asked of us to do intentionally. So we see in Deuteronomy 14, it says, Bring this tithe to eat before the Lord your God at the place he shall choose as his sanctuary. This applies to your tithes of grain, new wine, oil, and the firstborn of your flocks and herds. The, and here, here's just, write this down, because you probably don't have this exact translation, you're not reading from this, but write this down. The purpose of tithing, coming out of Deuteronomy 14, is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. The purpose of tithing is not to build God's ego. The purpose of tithing is not because God needs your money, and without it, he couldn't accomplish it, his mission in the church. The purpose of tithing is not to provide you pain. The purpose of tithing, according to Deuteronomy, is to put God first in your life. And so, I mean, this is, this is one of those principles that will never change here, is putting God first. And this is just a great principle for life in general, if we can take finances out of it, okay? Put God first in your life. Whatever you want God to bless, put him first in. So let's take finances out of it and take that off the table for right now. If you want God to bless your marriage, put him first in your marriage. If you want God to bless your home, your family, put him first in your home and your family. If you want God to bless your dating life, Put God first in your dating life. If you want God to bless your finances, put God first in your finances. The purpose of tithing is to put God first. It's a training mechanism because God knows wherever your money is, most of the time your heart is there as well. And so you put your money where your heart is and God wants you to put him first in your life because he loves you. He doesn't necessarily want your money. He wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your soul. He wants you. And so the purpose of tithing is so that we would place God first in our life. Put God first wherever you want God to bless it and even protect it. Malachi 3, 10 through 12 says, bring the whole tithe into the storehouse so that there may be food in my house. Test me in this. Now, this is the only place in the entire Bible where God says, test me. Everywhere else says, do not test the Lord thy God. This is the only place in the Bible that says, test me in this, says the Lord Almighty, and see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. I will prevent, or other translations say protect. I will prevent pests from dev devouring your crops. And the vines in your fields will not drop their fruit before it is ripe, says the Lord Almighty. God will bless and protect whatever you place him first in. So you place him first in your marriage, he will bless and protect that. You place him first in your finances, he will bless but also protect that. And God wants to bless your life. He wants to bless your kids and your family. He wants to protect your home. He wants to protect your life. If we might just place him first in it. Now, one of the best things I ever did in my life was to begin rearranging my life so I could honor God first in it. When it uh, uh, specifically when it comes to finances. Because... I had to plan all of a sudden now that I'm giving up money and I'm giving things away and I'm tithing to the Lord. I had to plan around that. 
And all of a sudden, it's like, I'm used to taking all of it. And when I first began tithing, I was, took a part-time job here at the church in kids ministry. I'm, you know, a teenager at this time. And I'm working nights at a restaurant. I didn't have a lot to my own name. And so all of a sudden, I have to get creative. I have to become innovative in some type of way with, well, I know the Lord has asked me of this, so I'm going to do that and see where God blesses me. But at the same time, I have to be creative with my own life. I'm not just going to sit here. And so, you know, I began like buying and selling cars on Craigslist and like buying old used cars and then like selling them for a profit. You know, I started a, a, a lawn care business when I was like 18 years old. I worked it for like four months and, you know, made good money over the summer from like May to September. And then I went around to all the customers I had and had them sign a contract that said, you will uh, use me next summer when it comes around. And then in my mind, I actually wasn't going to honor that contract myself because I was going to sell the contracts to someone else. And so then I on Craigslist posted lawn care business for sale, 50 customers contracted. And then I had like people calling me and they're like, we want to buy your contracts. We want to buy this. I had big companies in town. Anyways, all the big companies lowballed me, but everyone, there was a few other people. I ended up doing a business sale in the parking lot and some guy's hood of his car in the Rosars parking lot by five mile. Now, I don't know if that was IRS approved or not, but when I was 18, it sounded like a great plan that like you become more creative, you become more innovative because, and God blesses that because he's not just going to bless your bank account just because you start giving. But all of a sudden when we start giving to God, he begins blessing areas of your life where there might be gifts, there might be creativity, there might be levels of innovation, entrepreneurship in your life that maybe were suppressed or laying dormant and all of a sudden God unlocks those and you go like, wow, I like to sell things or I'm good at running a business or I'm good at this or I'm that or you begin to become more creative with your life on how can I support my, my family or my life or get my college degree or whatever it may be that God wants to bless far more than just does your bank account go up and down. That might happen through a variety of channels or ways, but God wants to bless every area of your life, even the gifts that might lay dormant if you just say, here, I'm giving this back to you, God. When you first begin to do this, it's a challenge, but it's worth it. I promise that God is faithful, and I'm a testament of that. And many of the, the things I enjoy today in my 30s are because of direct decisions I made in my 20s and how God blessed those. Many of the hardships I face today in my 30s are decisions I made in my 20s. And many of you could probably attest to this if you're over you know, uh, 30 and you're in your 40s, 50s, 60s, 70s, that you can probably attest to if you're you know, 40 years old and you're, you know, 10 years older than me, um, that you could probably say many of the good things in your life right now are decisions you made in your 20s and 30s. And many of the things, your hardships you have right now are decisions you made in your 20s or 30s. Or if you're 60 or 70, you could probably say many of the good things you're experiencing right now in your 60s are direct decisions you made in your 20s, 30s, 40s. And many of the hardships you have are probably directly related to decisions you made in your 20s, 30s, 40s. And I want to say one of the, those decisions that I made in my 20s, uh, or late teens, that I was, that was the best decision I made was to begin giving to God. And uh, many of you, I'm sure, in here could attest to that as well as you've grown in your life and say that is one of the best decisions you can financially make. That God wants to develop your heart. He wants your heart. He wants to develop your commitment, your faithfulness, Will you be faithful with the few things so that he might entrust you with many things and really gain true riches that go beyond worldly wealth? Because God is always faithful. You'll never be able to outgive God. It might feel hard to you, but you'll never be able to outgive God on how he might want to bless your life. Tithing is where you give to God and you give him, you give him, uh, uh, 
you know, a tenth of what you have. And his reply to that is not just, here's more money back to you, but his reply is now everything in your life that has potential, relationally, emotionally, uh, uh, financially, uh, your gifts, your abilities, whatever in your life has potential will now be blessed and will begin to increase. And that means that you don't want to not do that. I want to experience God's blessing in all the areas of my life that might have potential that those would be blessed and increase. And this is where God says, test me on this, I'll pour out a blessing because God is faithful. So put God first. Another thing when it comes to tithing is live like a steward. We talked about stewardship early on and we'll talk a little bit more about stewardship next week, but live like a steward not like an owner. When you live like an owner about all your possessions, it's this is my stuff and I own it and I will decide what I do with it and I will decide if I give any back to the Lord. We wanna live like a steward because stewardship is everything is God's. Your house is God's. Your car is God's. Your family is God's. Your kids is God's. Your, your whole life is God's. Your bank account is God. He owns everything. It's all his, and he's entrusted something to you. And so if we live like an owner, we live like, this is my stuff. Steward says, this is God's stuff. Lord, what would you want? How can I care and tend the things that you've given me? How can I tend this car you've blessed me with? How can I care for this apartment you've blessed me with? How can I care for the, the, the job that you've given to me, that you've blessed me with? How can I care for the financial, financial aspect of life that you've given to me? What do you want out of this? Now, maybe have you ever been like loaned something that wasn't yours? Maybe like your car was in the shop and someone loaned you a car. Or maybe someone loaned you like a vacation house or you know, someone said, I need you to pet sit my cat or my dog. Now, if someone loans you a car, do you drive that car like you drive your own car? No, you don't. If you've ever rented a car, you know, it's just like you're, you don't want anything to have, you don't want any scratches on it, or anything, like you drive it carefully, because it's like, that's not your car. Enterprise loaned it to you for a, a couple days. And you care for it differently because it, you view it as you're stewarding that vehicle. Or if you're, you know, dog sitting for someone, you're stewarding that animal. You're like, did I feed it? Did I give it its stuff? Did I this? I don't want it to die. I don't want them to come back to their dead cat. You steward what's not yours with a different mindset. And if anything happens, you just blame your kids. <laughs> but you steward it differently when it's not yours. And this is the mindset that we must have when it comes to our life, that this is God's stuff. How might I steward the God? Lord, what, how do you want me to care for my, for my house? Lord, how do you want me to care for my finances and my money? How do you want me to care? This is yours, Lord. I wanna be careful with it. I don't wanna mess up with it. I wanna make sure I'm doing what you've asked of me to do. You get real careful with stuff that's not yours. And the stuff that we have is not ours. God's, and he's entrusted it to you. None of it's mine. It all belongs to Jesus. So Lord, how do you want me to manage it? Lord, how do you want me to manage your money? Lord, how do you want me to manage your car that you've loaned to me? How, what should I do with it? How should I, what should I do? All those things. And once this perspective shift happens, it's radical change begins to take place in your life on how, what God has asked you to do, how he's asked you to live, and how he's asked you to manage his resources and his tithing, or our tithing. Now, I wanna just address a question really quick here, and I wanna be very honest with it. The question is, is tithing required? I'm sure many of you have thought that before on some level. Is tithing required as Christians? And I wanna be careful here because really smart people that have letters, extra letters that come after their name, debate this, all right? It is not a black and white issue. And when it comes to is tithing required, I just wanna be able to present, you know, not just what Nate thinks, but what uh, multiple theologians think on this. 
Because tithing isn't a primary doctrine of the church, which means it has nothing in relation to your salvation. And um, it's a secondary issue, um, which means that we can talk about it, we can engage in it, and we might even disagree on certain things and still be friends and all go to heaven. Amen? Amen. And so that being said, is it required? Let me say, let me ask this question. Is being kind required? Because you cannot be kind and still go to heaven, right? God doesn't require you to be kind in order for you to experience eternity. But God has asked us to be kind, hasn't he? And I think when it comes to giving to God, is giving required? Well, you're not gonna not be in eternity if you don't give. But this is an issue that we wanna look at in some level because people disagree on it. And here, let me give you the points that people disagree on. All right? Just so I'm fair to, to everything. One is that many people view tithing as part of the Mosaic Law. The Mosaic Law was instituted after Moses, and they, you know, built, they had all these other laws that came on. There was the Levites, the Aaronic priesthood, and they instituted certain laws. And the, the law of tithing specifically was instituted during the Mosaic Law. And so what some people believe is, no, that those are things that we should continue to do today because we see it throughout Scripture. Others in that, that tithe was given to the tabernacle, the temple, and the, the Levitical and, uh, priests that were tending it at the time, and given to the poor to help them and whatnot. Um, and so, but others say, well, hold on, back up a little bit, right? That there's not just the Mosaic Law. We see this principle of giving of a tenth, even pre Mosaic law, that we can go back to Abraham, and when Melchizedek appeared to Abraham out of the blue, Abraham offered a tenth of what he had to Melchizedek. Or Jacob, when he was, you know, meeting with God, that Jacob said, basically, if you bless me, I will give you a tenth back. Now, we never see in the Old Testament if Jacob ever honored that vow of giving of the tenth, but needless to say, we see this, this uh, idea of giving of a tenth even before the Mosaic law. And then in the New Testament, others say, well, hold on. Jesus affirmed tithing when he told the Pharisees that you need to, you need to honor the tithe. But then others say, like, well, hold on. Jesus was a faithful Jew living under the Mosaic law. And the Mosaic law didn't go away for Christians until Jesus died and rose again. And then we are no longer under the law that, that Jesus accomplished that and we live under a new covenant. And so you can't necessarily say just because Jesus affirmed that the Pharisees needed to honor the Mosaic law that we have to today as well. But then others say like, well, no, like, you know, what Jesus said is that Jesus doesn't change from yesterday, today, and forever. The word of the Lord endures. That like those things we should take really seriously at heart that if Jesus faithfully honored that himself. He had, you know, some more clever ways of honoring his tithe by, you know, getting coins out of fish's mouth and stuff that we might not, but either way, he did it. And then we also see New Testament-wise, writers like Paul and others talk about generosity. Now, some of these New Testament writers don't specifically label it a tithe or a tenth, but here's what, what basically you can uh, take from the New Testament, uh, post-Jesus, when it comes to giving, is that in summary, New Testament writers say that we are to give sacrificial, generous giving. Now, you can look at that in 2 Corinthians 8 and 9 and many other places in the New Testament, that what are we asked to do is to sacrificially, generously give. Now, if we wanted to take that aspect of it and say the tithe is no longer, we don't have to give it a tenth anymore, and then we are living in this world here, which is sacrificial, generous giving. Now, when we look at sacrificial, generous giving, one or two percent for almost virtually everyone is not sacrificial, generous giving, is it? For most people, 10 percent is not sacrificial, generous giving. And so whether you look at Old Testament law that affirms 10% or New Testament law, which is sacrificial, generous giving, it, it kind of comes down to the question, is it 10% or New Testament-wise, is it sacrificial, generous giving? 
I'm going to leave that one in your hands. Here's what 2 Corinthians 9, 6 says. Remember this. A farmer who plants only a few seeds will get a small crop. But the one who plants generously will get a generous crop. You must each decide in your heart how much to give. And don't give reluctantly or in response to pressure. So anyone who feels pressure right now, I want you to release that. I don't want to pressure you to give whatsoever. For God loves a person who gives cheerfully. Sacrificial, generous giving. Is it 10%? Is it sacrificial, generous giving? It's probably, you know, meet in the middle. It's a combination of both. But here's what I like about 10% giving. Is that you don't spread it out. You don't give it to... Some of it to nonprofits, and some of it you give 10% to the house of the Lord. And here's why I like 10% is because it provides consistency. And we want to be, at the end of the day, faithful to God. We want to be faithful to Him. He's asked us to be faithful, to steward, and this provides consistency. That you're not constantly going this month, that month, do I give this, do I give that, blah, blah, blah. it provides consistency. Now, if you want to lean on the side of sacrificial, generous giving, I'm going to allow you to be the one who decides what is sacrificial, generous giving in your life. Um, so let's move on. La- last thing here is that we are to live thankful, that we put God first. We live like stewards, and we live thankful when it comes to our finances and tithing, all right? Because God wants to bless you. God doesn't just want to bless your bank account. He wants to bless your entire life. Who cares if your bank account is, is stacked, but your life is in ruins? This is where the scriptures say, who, you know, what, is it, what does it matter if someone gains the whole world but loses their soul? That God wants to bless your whole life, physically, mentally, emotionally, relationally, financially, all of it. God wants to bless you, and he wants to bless you even beyond your wildest dreams. I love what Eugene Peterson writes in the message translation of Malachi 3.10, what we just read. He says, bring the full tithe into the temple treasury, so there will be ample provision in my temple. Test me in this and see if I don't open up heaven itself to you and pour out blessing beyond your wildest dreams. Thanks, Eugene. That God wants to bless you beyond your wildest dreams. And you might have big dreams for your life. What might take place and what might happen if you're younger, you're, you know, you're just like, oh, I could do this or I could do that. And wow, how cool it would be this. Whatever your dreams are, they pale in comparison to what God might want to do. Because he wants to bless you beyond your wildest dreams. The biggest stuff that you plan up what your marriage will look like, what your ki- how your kids will grow up, what your ministry could look like, what your life, he wants to bless you beyond whatever you might come up with in your wildest dreams if you would just put him first. And so in that, it's just like, wow. In that, I'm thankful for what you've given me, God. And that whether you, I'm, I make 300, 3,000, 30,000, 300,000, I wanna give generously back to the Lord because he wants to bless me beyond my wildest dreams. And when I tithe, I make my money all about Jesus, not about me. Because giving is this lifestyle that we enter into and God blesses it. And we don't give to get. This is what Pastor Robert Morris says. We don't give to get. We give to give. We give thankfully cheerfully. It's not getting something back. We give to give because we're thankful and grateful for what God has done. Therefore, I want to live thankful. It's not just about me and and my bank account. It's about God. It's about Jesus. God doesn't want your money. He wants you. He wants you in your life. This is why psalmist writes that we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise, give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. His unfailing love continues forever and his faithfulness continues to each generation. God will be faithful to you and will bless you beyond your wildest dreams if you enter into with a thankful heart and say yes to you, Jesus. Thank you, God, that you've given me what I could never earn by myself. Thank you for giving me 
my family. Thank you for giving me this life. Thank you for giving me this job. Thank you for giving me resource and talents and abilities that I could have never earned by myself. God, thank you that you know me, that you love me, you care for me. Thank you that you died for me. I'm grateful that the God of the universe knows my name, knows every hair on my head. Thank you, Jesus, that I am already blessed and God wants to bless me beyond my wildest dreams. Would you pray with me? Lord, we are thankful for you, Jesus. We're thankful for you, God. Lord, you are good and you are faithful. And in spite of all our failures, God, you are still there. You still care. You're still faithful. Lord, we just come before you. Would you take any pressure off, any confusion out of the room right now, Jesus? It's not what it's about. Lord, we want your blessing in our life. Lord, we love you and we thank you. And we pray this in your name.